All right, here we go. The resurrection, as I believe we talked about, I go over the bell ringer yesterday from 1 Corinthians 15. St. Paul says, if we Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we're wasting our time. You know, nothing matter, nothing of Jesus matters if he didn't rise from the dead. I'm going to further elaborate on the importance of it while as I describe the resurrection as I'll, I'll get to it as a historical and transcendent event. So y'all know what historical means. It happened in real time um, that the resurrection that the resurrection actually happened. You will you will hear people as you go through life oftentimes around Easter time saying, oh, Jesus didn't actually rise from the dead. It was just kind of like he lives now in our hearts. And that's that's malarkey. You know, that uh, the resurrection of Jesus is a historical event. People witnessed it. There is no body in the tomb. OK, um, not that you can necessarily prove it, but it's historical. Transcendent. What is it? What does that word mean? What is it? What does trans mean? A change, a change to transport something, change the location, to transfer something, to move it. Uh, transportation, you know, all of it. Transgender moving from one gender to another. I'm going to say that because that's what you're all thinking right now. Okay. So transcendent means to move from one realm to another. We currently live in the world, uh, planet Earth within space and time. The resurrection is an event that uh, happened from outside of the world into the world, lifting all the world, giving us access to heaven. It's a transcendent event because it connects heaven and earth. Um, the event itself, of course, was by God's power, but it, it impacts every human life. We can now go to heaven. As you saw in the movie Risen Bartholomew. When he's being questioned by Clavius, so what does this resurrection mean to you? And Bartholomew's like, oh, eternal life. Like, if, if he died, he paid our price, and then when he comes back to life, now we can live in him, now we can live forever in heaven with God, like, just the way God intended it to be all along. So that's what it means to call this event a transcendent event, okay? Um, yeah, I'll explain more of the timeline on the board, but y'all are kind of behind the other classes, so... I got it. We're going to go through basically Bible stories from here to the end of the chapter on what, what happened. Okay, starting in Matthew 28, verse 1. Let's go there in our Bibles. <whistles> Matthew 28. That's fine. It's Maya that needs to get a house. That's on record. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, Matthew 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath. What day of the week is the Sabbath? Sunday. Saturday. For the Jewish people, it's Saturday, the seventh day of the week. This is after the Sabbath. As the first day of the week was dawning, here we are on Sunday morning. This is... To, some of you might already know this. This is why um, Catholics, we Christians, really all Christians, go to church on the first day of the week because this is the day that everything truly came to fulfillment on Sunday morning. Jesus wrote a new page, and this new covenant is so important that it moves the holy day from Saturday to Sunday. So the first day of the week, Sunday is now the holy day. Jews today still celebrate Saturday as the Sabbath, and Muslims celebrate Friday as the Holy Day. I don't know why exactly. I should probably research that. But, you know, this this is why we go to Mass on Sunday. Every Sunday you wake up to go to Mass, it's like you're going to the tomb to praise God for the resurrection and redemption He has now offered and won for you. You know, that's, that's why we go Sunday morning. I know teenagers like to go in the evenings so you can sleep until 2 p.m. All right, so first day of the week, it was dawning. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. 
Anybody ever experienced an earthquake? Where? Yeah. Yeah, that's just another day in life of California. I experienced two in Guatemala and one of all places in Washington, D.C. It's jolting, wasn't it? It's pretty cool. It's sad because, you know, people die. But it's really like, um, you know, I was on a second story building and you just felt the whole building shake like you're on a roller coaster. Like you're like swaying. Um, yeah. So anyways, it's very jolting. And you're going to see um, extreme reactions from this earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven, approached, rolled back the stone. This angel is jacked and sat upon it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was white as snow. The guards were shaken with fear of him and became like dead men. So the guards became like dead men, which probably means they passed out. And uh, I do like how the movie Risen depicted these soldiers. They were, you know, low-level soldiers. They're guarding a dead man um, or watching a tomb. They had to be low-level soldiers. But they are completely traumatized by this angelic, divine event with earthquakes and lightning and one angel moving a boulder by themselves that would take, you know, a dozen men to push. Um, you know, this is the power of the angels, power of the event, so much so that they pass out. Uh, we'll say they passed out. All scripture says they became like dead men. Um, the significance of that is when Jesus arises from the tomb and establishes his new covenant, if you want to go to heaven, the Bible says you have to believe Jesus and believe that he came back from the dead. Uh, those who do not believe in Jesus will live in their death and will live a life of death, and those are the Roman guards. The imagery here is that Jesus, if you live a life of death, you're going to fall further into that, but if you can open your hearts to Jesus like Mary Magdalene and the other women, you will live and, and prosper. Okay, so there's a life and death imagery there. Then the angel said to the woman, women in reply, do not be afraid. I know that you are seeking Jesus, the crucified. He's not here for he has been raised just as he said. Which is important to note, um, since we had a run through Jesus's public ministry so quickly, Jesus said six times in the Gospel of Matthew. Gospel of Matthew, six times he said, I will die, I'll be crucified, I'll be handed over, but on the third day I will rise again. Six times. Apostle still didn't grasp it. And Mary Magdalene didn't quite either. She went to the tomb just to anoint the body. She was not expecting this historical transcendent event. And, you know, it's... I feel like uh, the image I'm getting right now is like y'all sophomores, maybe not period five, but y'all sophomores for the first payo test. And it's like, I tell you, half the test, you have to write out the answer, and the other half is multiple choice. Okay, Mr. Payo. And then you sit down and write down an answer, and you're like, well, I don't know anything. You know? It's just like you can be told something, but for it to process and for you to experience it is a whole nother thing. And nobody ever experienced somebody bringing themselves back from the dead. Jesus rose people from the dead, three people in the Bible. But this is Jesus raising himself from the dead, just as he said. So I want you to know that this, this, was, this is important, because if Jesus doesn't rise, rise from the dead, what he said was false. You can discredit Jesus. He is not the Messiah. All right, what happens next? Just as, Are the angels talking? Um, and then let's go to verse 7. Then go quickly and tell his disciples he has been raised from the dead, and he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Then they went away quickly from the tomb, fearfully yet overjoyed, and ran to announce this to the disciples. And behold, while they're going to the disciples, Jesus met them on their way and greeted them. They approached, embraced his feet, and did him homage. Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go Tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So the message they have, other than Jesus is risen, is go to Galilee. Anybody remember how far away Galilee is? Okay, when you're done writing that, check out the, the map, okay? Which I 
haven't used so much since we talked about Jesus' birth, but Jerusalem right here, this is where the apostles are kind of hiding out. And Jesus appears, dies, rises here. And he says, oh, just go to Galilee. Just, just you know, see you there in a couple of weeks. You know, they had to walk all this way. They probably got to walk around Samaria because Jews and Samaritans don't get along. So they'd have to take the long way all the way back to not even just the southern tip, but as you saw in the movie, the Sea of Galilee is where they're going to see Jesus. And we're going to talk about that apparition in uh, lesson four of this chapter. But Jesus says, all right, I'll meet you back in Galilee. All right. So that's that's the Easter morning story according to Matthew 28. I want to look in more detail at this at this story through the lens of the Gospel of John. Chapter 20. Did we talk about Mary Magdalene yet? Who was Mary Magdalene? What was her uh, what was her profession? She was a prostitute. A woman of the night. She wasn't? What? Hmm... Yes, yeah. That's that's debatable. Um, uh, woman that wasn't associated with any man Woman that wasn't associated with any man Jesus. Yeah, well, he, he, here's here's the differentiation. I I do not. You are correct in that. I do not think you will find in the Bible Mary Magdalene, the former prostitute. You will find in the Gospel of John somewhere Mary Magdalene, of whom Jesus cast out seven demons. Seven demons. She's a demoniac. Now, you combine that with other passages that we attribute to Mary Magdalene with church tradition, which is what the apostles hand on, that this woman was was deep in sin, which is reasonable. Frankly, I think having seven demons is worse than being a prostitute. Um, But one probably led to the other. Yeah, I'm not invoking scripture. I'm invoking church tradition. Uh, But that is debate even amongst, um, you know, modern Catholics. The question is, do you... Do you believe in, in Catholic Church passing on a, a tradition that is valid or not? Um, so, yeah. I mean, strictly biblically speaking, you can make that argument, uh, maybe. That being said, even in that non-Catholic movie you saw Risen, Mary Magdalene is portrayed as a prostitute, a woman of the night, who has a conversion once Jesus, or whatever sin you want to label on her, she had to have be delivered because... You know, she had seven demons. Jesus heals her. She turns to Jesus. She's a, she becomes a disciple. She is going to take care of the body of Jesus. All right. Mary came to the tomb early in the morning while it was still dark. Before the sun is even up, she's going to the tomb. And that's a beautiful image uh, of what the faith that she had. Not that she believed that Jesus would rise from the dead that day. But she was faithful. And there's this image that you can enter into Mary Magdalene walking in the darkness, seeking Jesus and experiencing this great joy once she actually encounters him. Uh, She saw the stone removed. So she ran, went to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved and told them they've taken the Lord. Okay. And then Peter and John run and see the burial cloths. Turn the page. We're going to jump to verse 11. So Peter and John peace out. They're like, oh my goodness, what's going on? What happened? Mary Magdalene, verse 11, stayed outside the tomb weeping. And as she wept, she bent over the tomb and saw two angels in white sitting there, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? 
she said to them, They have taken my Lord, and I don't know where they laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus there, but did not know it was Jesus. That's a common occurrence when Jesus is resurrected. People don't recognize him. And whether it's he's got different clothes on or he has a different different voice in a different or in a resurrected body, we don't know. But nobody recognizes Jesus, as you might have gotten from your Ed Puzzle Bell ringer. Okay. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? She thought it was the gardener. Pause. That's our first note on this story in John 20. She thought it was a gardener, which tells you that this tomb of Jesus is within a garden. And when you see garden in the Bible, what do you think about? Adam and Eve, Garden of Eden. And that is, you can always trace every garden imagery. We had one last chapter, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He goes into the garden to pray to begin the redemption process, to fix the sin of Adam and Eve. Here Jesus rises in a garden, actually looks like a gardener, which is what Adam had the job of, tilling and keeping the soil. He appears as the new Adam, the redeemed humanity. But he's not with his mother Mary, who we know is the new Eve, and I'll teach you later in the year, model of the church. He's with Mary Magdalene, who everybody knows has a sinful past, who was a demoniac. You know, So the, the imagery here is um, Jesus, the bridegroom, really taking his taking his you know sinful church and, and and kind of guiding them guiding us towards heaven it's a beautiful image you know of mercy so it's in a garden with a man and a woman but it's a different image here it's, it's an image of redemption okay and G and she's gonna get really excited Jesus is going to say her name and that's gonna spark her recognition verse 16 Jesus said to her Mary she turned and said to him in Hebrew Raboni which means teacher, Jesus said to her, Stop holding on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and tell them I am going to my Father and your Father, to my God and to your God. So he says, Don't hold on to me. Um, and, and all we mean by that, all that the way Catholics read the Bible, is that Jesus is simply saying, I'm not here to stay. Do not get too comfortable with me here. Do not cling to me, is another translation. Because I got to go back to the I'm going to heaven. I have to go prepare a place. Some people, oh, and by some I mean, unfortunately, a lot of people look at this verse and say, "Ooh, Mary Magdalene and Jesus had some relations." Some people say they were married. Some people say they just had sexual relations. A lot of, a lot of bogus stuff out there. I was taught that in high school. That's when I was like, okay, the world needs better high school religion teachers. It's simply that Jesus is saying, don't, don't cling to me. I'm not here to stay. You know, Don't get used to this. But instead, go to my apostles. Tell them I'm risen. Tell them to go to Galilee. And this is, um, it shows the importance of women, how Jesus exalted the role of women, whether it be his own mother, who is the new Eve, or Mary Magdalene, who was a demoniac, probably a prostitute. Yes, Maya? Well, was one of the other apostles running back to his tomb? In this story, all we have is Peter and John running to an empty tomb and then running back. So they aren't just for like this part? No. Oh, okay. No. Like guys, they're like, okay, what are we going to do? I don't know. And then Mary's just weeping. You know, it's just everybody's a mess. Yeah. These are the people Jesus picked. All right, so one thing, and then I'll call on Gracie. Mary Magdalene has been given this a title. She is the apostle to the apostles. The word apostle means one who is sent. So Mary is sent to those who are sent into the world to proclaim the good news. So she was the first one to proclaim the good news of the resurrection. Unfortunately, she was not well received. I mean, she wasn't like... Shunned, but they didn't quite believe her. Gracie? I was going to ask, or like, say it wasn't um, the Celtic Gospels, Mary, like, wasn't that where they embraced the Apostles? Not familiar. You could research it. Um, I don't know the origin of that title. No, I don't know. You could be right. I, I think I could. 
Okay. Um, either way, it just shows the, the value of Mary Magdalene, the importance, um, how Jesus exalted the role of women. Um, and it's, once again, a beautiful image of mercy, as I've already mentioned. So that is lesson one. I'm not done. But that's lesson one right here. You got Jesus with his, with his hoe, you know, working in the garden. He says, Mary, we got a shroud in the tomb. We got two angels. We got dead men. The sun is just rising. Mary Magdalene goes out. It's dark. Just Matthew 28 and John 20. Don't forget about the squiggly line. That means earthquake. We're going we're gonna to talk about your bell ringer, I think, a little bit on the road to Emmaus. I want to give you a handout next class. Not now. As I try to time the, uh, the ending of this class. Oh, we still have plenty of time. Okay, so let's talk about your bell ringer, your Ed Puzzle. You watched a little clip on these two disciples who are walking about. And why don't we have our Bibles open to Luke 24 so that it's more clear to us what's going on. Now, this is still Easter Sunday morning. Maybe after Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene, he then goes to appear to these two random blokes walking to Emmaus, away from Jerusalem. They're probably all done celebrating the Passover. But what is their attitude? What did you pick up from the video? They're sad. Why are they so sad? Yeah, they were really getting excited about this Jesus character. They were really excited that he was the Messiah. And then he died. And so they tell him, they tell this stranger this, the stranger here pictured in white, of course, like, yeah, it's, have you not heard about this? We're just discouraged, you know, because we were really getting excited about Jesus. Um, and then, I don't know if you got this in the video, but look at verse 25. This is a common theme of lesson two and three. And Jesus said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! Idiots! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophet spoke. It's like you never read the Bible. He gets sassy. And Jesus gets a little feisty, you know? Uh, and he's going to keep doing this <laughs> for at least a couple of days, you know? Um, and then he goes on, you saw in the, in the video, he walks with them. He says, what about Isaiah? What about this? And what about that Old Testament passage? Wasn't the Messiah supposed to die, get even tortured to death? And in doing so, that torture will redeem Israel. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We forgot about those passages. We really like the ones about the kingdom and the, the power of God. And Jesus is like, well, yeah, you got to read it all together. So they keep on walking and, and then they're ready to split. And uh, Jesus is like, all right, peace out. Now, they don't know it's Jesus. So you got to keep that in mind. And they say, oh, no, stay with us. We really enjoy talking to you, so why don't you come eat with us? And he says, all right. Sits down. Jesus, person, breaks the bread. And Scripture says, in verse 30, And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened and recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. So he's like, here I am. Uh, like, you know, like, it's me. And then he's gone after he breaks the bread. Okay. Any insights into this story? What, why does Jesus make this apparition? What, what is, what, what, what message are we to take? What about just breaking the bread? Why, why does he vanish when he breaks the bread? Yeah, he's saying like, yeah, you remember like right before I died? Now these these disciples wouldn't, but they're going to tell the apostles. He broke the bread and that was him. The apostles should be clicking in their brains like, oh yeah, this is my body, this is my blood. So that's the Eucharist. And Jesus' point is that I'm walking with you, I'm teaching you, I'm inspiring you. You feel your heart's burning. I'm still with you in the bread. You know, 
Okay, so what happens here? Let's break down. Usually I want you to go into certain verses and understand the deeper meaning of the verse. The most important thing about this story on the road to Emmaus is this. That there are two parts of this encounter. The first part is Jesus opens their mind to the scriptures. And the second part is he breaks the bread and then they recognize him. Sound like anything you did today? When Sloan and Molly read those beautiful readings today, and we were enlightened with scriptures, and we say, yes, Jesus founded a church on the apostles, which is what those readings were about. And then Father Brian Taylor went up, and he took the bread, and he broke it, and he said, this is my body, this is my blood given for you. What is happening in the road to Emmaus is a mini mass. You know, and that's how Jesus communicates to us. And in his resurrection, he remains with us, first and foremost in the sacrament, of the Eucharist, which we always accompany with Scripture, to enlighten our minds so that Jesus can touch our hearts all the better. So there's two parts of this road to Emmaus, and it's everything we do at the Catholic Mass today. Uh, the breaking of the bread slash Eucharist, and we encounter Jesus in that bread. So these disciples are going to get jacked up so excited for obvious reasons, and they run to the apostles. And they tell the apostles, hey, you never guess, we, 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 we saw Jesus, and, we, and he told us this, and we never realized that. And then we sat down, and he broke bread, and then he was gone. The apostles are like, oh boy, another crazy story. <laughs> so what we're going to do is keep reading in the Gospel of Luke about his account of uh, the road to Emmaus. And we're just going to do these like 13 verses in Luke, and then we'll call it a day. While they were still speaking about this, and that's the disciples were talking about Jesus' apparition, he, Jesus, stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. That's Jesus' uh, that's his tagline in the resurrection. Peace be with you. That's how he greets apostles. Um, I'll explain the significance of that phrase to you next class. Peace to you. Okay. Uh, it's also, uh, Jesus just appears. He doesn't knock on the door. He doesn't walk and says, here's Jesus. No. He just, whoosh, resurrected body, he's got, he just appears, showing them that he is um, divine, transcendent, all the above, to help them recognize that he is, he is the, new, the new man. Then he said to them, why are you troubled? Why, why, why are you acting all surprised, y'all? If Jesus was Cajun, that's what he might have said. And then he said, and why do questions arise in your hearts? Why is this news to you? Why does this surprise you? Look at my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, because a ghost doesn't have flesh and bones, as you can see I have. So he's fussing at him. He's like, come on, y'all, get with the program. I talked to you for like three years about this. Um, I was hoping for a little bit more. So he is going to rebuke them. And then he says, you want to see how real I am? That my body actually rose from the dead, like I said? Give me some food. Touch my wounds. The wounds Jesus keeps. He keeps the wounds because it's those wounds that he will present to the Father and basically say, I have redeemed them. I have, I have died for them. I, I hung for them. I was pierced for them. And so it's those wounds that he keeps to basically allow us to get into heaven. Through his wounds, we are healed. Uh, I think Isaiah said, maybe chapter 52. And then he's going to go on to commission them, saying that, um, go into the world, proclaim the good news, I'll be with you, you'll be my witnesses, etc., etc., you'll perform these miracles. What we're going to see is that this account is very similar to Mark and to the uh, John, John's account. We're going to, I'm going to go through these next class as we are running out of time, but Jesus rebukes them. He fusses at them, he offers them peace, but then he says, I'm still, I, I still like y'all. So, so go and proclaim the good news. Um, 
and forgive sins and uh, bring all back to God. So um, this this is basically the outline of his apparition. Now, I would say this probably happened on Easter Sunday evening. And then the next thing we hear about is a whole week later, on the eighth day of Easter, Thomas has got to join the party. And we'll talk about Thomas next class. Yep.